Ladies and gentlemen and children of all ages, that plays the thing with your host, Judy Sleed. Special guest, D. Curtis DeForest, Jr. Judy, Judy. That's just lovely. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here and have Curtis as my current playmate. <laughs> How are you, Curtis? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Judy. Well, I've known you for quite a while, and uh, I've been uh, thinking of get, asking you to come on the show, so you're finally Glad here. Glad you did. And we have this big contraption here. It's called <laughs> a surdo. Surdo. Uh, S U R D O. It's uh, for Brazilian mountain music, samba. Really? You mean they have different? This is actually a drum, mm -hmm. but they have different. I've never seen a drum like this. Well, this drum usually plays with another drum that looks just like it, only a little bit smaller. And those two drums are syncopated, so one hits and the other answers, and it's just like that. And now I'm saying one and two and one and two, but actually samba is a five beat. So there's a little something going on there, and I don't understand it as well as I can play it, you know? And I am number one surdo, and that means I go on the two. So, um, like I said, usually you hear with another samba, uh, with another surdo. So I'll just play what you would hear. You'd. Um, That's the other one playing. So depending on what the, uh, uh, what the uh, hiponique, which is the call drum, tells us to do, we answer. And it's very regimented in that respect. There's a, there's a, a hierarchy. There's the, the uh, hiponique, which is about one-sixth the size of this. And it calls everything, when we start, when we stop, and when, whatever we do in between. It is really fascinating, because uh, all my life, I love music. and. Uh, piano is my instrument and I never knew that drums could be so different I'm just learning somebody else was Jay Schneiderman was here and he played some different djembe djembe and that's West African now if you believe in the whole cradle of civilization story that it was all pretty much Africa and and all around there I like to see how language left from uh, Africa and became all these different dialects. I mean, you know, it, it went up over the top of the world, it went around to the east, it went to the west, across the ocean. Same thing with drum beats. Everybody had their own way of, of doing a drum beat and they also, you know, they would hear, if I hit this, like for example, I don't know where this comes from. This is an udu and an udu, <laughs> you get this? This I got, <laughs> got this in Florida. But the thing is, the thing is, is that it is um, a, a common instrument. It's a primitive instrument. And it's, you know, there's no right or wrong about this other than the way you make contact. You could do it on this part here. Oh, it's a different Changes the sound. pitch. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's And it's like a water drop in there. But I like this side better. So you, uh, I heard your band just one time, but I understand you do a, a lot of other. Yes. Uh, where do you play, and well, how many people are in the band? Well, there's the Escola de Samba, which is how I got in, in touch with samba in the first place. And Escola de Samba is run by Richie Siegler. And uh, Richie does the head drum. He does the lead drum called the Hiponique. And he's taught us everything. I had prior experience doing, um, I feel like I'm doing a resume here. I had prior experience <laughs> with uh, Jay Schneiderman. We used to go to um, what's now called Resort, but it was called, um, oh God, what was it called? Uh, Envy, Envy Tsunami. It's, it's over there, you know, on uh, Three Mile Harbor Road. And we would play together with the music, he and I, and we would play djembe, like I said, uh, uh, African, uh, um, I think it's South African, West African, anyway. Um, so, you know, about percussion is really what this is for me. And I like different percussive instruments. And there's, there's a world of percussion that I haven't even touched yet. 
But um, there's the Samba, Escola de Samba, and then there's a splinter group from Escola de Samba called the Bastards. <laughs> the Bastards of Boom. So there's Escola de Samba Boom, and then there's Bastards of Boom. And we have played at the Talk House as recently as uh, two Saturdays ago. Two Saturdays it is ago. To, you played this loud music there? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, but we have, place. when we do, yeah, <laughs> it, it fills the place. When we do the Bastards of Boom, we have a guitar and we have percussion and we mix up the instruments. It's not just samba anymore when we do the Bastards. So, so when you play, do people dance? Oh, or they... big time. They can't help it. <laughs> oh, just like Lee was dancing here before. Yes, you see, that's right. Lee was dancing before we oh, turn on so the camera. This is for that's right. Dan oh, it's just fascinating. Mm. There's so many aspects, different drums, and you know, the whole history. Yeah. It's, uh, you could give a class on that. Well, you know, the <laughs> biggest thing about drumming that I've learned, and it, it's just an irony for me, when I meet someone who is a drummer and doesn't know how to listen, it's almost impossible to play drumming to drum, any kind of a drum, without listening. And I got my own personal lesson in, in playing drums when I, when I first started, that I was not a listener. I was, you know. And when you have to shut up, it's not about shut up. It's about speak when there's an appropriate time. Like, when you drum, fill in the dark spot. If you and I were drumming right now, I would say you play when you want to. When you hear a, a regular open space, fill it, fill it. Why not? You know, that's its conversation. Right. Yeah, it's like playing the piano. When you have a melody, like a long note, you have to fill it in. Yes. <laughs> yes. With other things, it's fascinating. Maybe I'll take up drums. Oh well, you should definitely come <laughs> to the beach. I mean, that's an open invitation. Anybody come to uh, Sag Pond, um, Sa uh, Sag Main Beach, um, and we go on the Sag Pond side. Sometimes, if it's still there, oh God, what happened in the storms? But anyway, um, uh, we play there, and a lot of people come down, and they bring coolers, and I say, and if you bring a cooler, bring chocolate, please. <laughs> I love chocolate. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so, uh, how often do you do that? Every Monday, every Monday. Nice. We're starting next, uh, yep, every Monday at 6.30, actually 7. We're starting next Monday. Oh, weather permitting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, we people are listening. We're talking about the Hamptons. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the Hamptons. And we've even played in the rain. Really? We played in the rain. Thunder, lightning, eh, you know. Okay, then we get in the cars and go home. <laughs> so the rain cannot hurt these. It drugs. does not. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. Certainly doesn't hurt me. So. I also heard that you are an inventor. I'm always fascinated by people who invent things like. How can you invent things? I guess there's always something new that you could do in this old, old world. People are inventing things all the time. So what is it? What's the name of your inventor? It, invention. <laughs> the invention is the hyperbike. Hyperbike. Mm -hmm. And how did you come about doing this invention? Well, I was a cyclist for 30 years, and I was always frustrated and, and basically in pain because of the stupid bicycle seat. And then I used to love climbing hills, but, you know, and my legs were fine for climbing hills, but I always used to be upset that the only thing I was doing was pulling on the handlebars as I was pushing down on the pedals. And I'm thinking, you know, what a waste of your upper body. So my idea for the invention really came out of wanting to use my whole body to pedal, to cycle. You mean you were bicycling up the hill? If I bicycled up a hill, I always wondered, why can't I use my arms in some way other than just pulling on the handlebars? I you didn't know, even handlebars. know it was possible to do that. Yeah, yeah. When you do that, <laughs> well, you know, you're pulling because you want to keep yourself rooted, yeah. you know, and you want to keep yourself on the seat. But what I've done is I've attacked the whole different, uh, you know, I've, I've uh -huh. said, stand up, stand on the pedals, use your arms and legs. That blue part there that's kind of blending in with the clouds? Well, yeah. <clears throat> that is a strap that goes around your torso. And that theoretically will keep you from flying out of that um, thing. But, but your hips are held by the yellow strap. And mm -hmm. when you have your hips there, it really is only to start. Because once you get going in this bike, you're like gliding in there. You're like swimming. Like if you ever saw uh, a, a squirrel, a flying squirrel, jump from one tree to another. Their whole body is out like this. When you ride the hyperbike, you're like this. 
You use your back, you use your stomach, you use your shoulders, everything. How ingenious. Well, you know, like I said, it was frustration that I had, first of all, seats hurt. <laughs> they hurt everybody. Not just men, not just women, they hurt everybody. And, and to use, you know, just to use your, your, your legs is, and to hold onto the handlebars, look at my body, it's like curled up. And I got into a bad posture. I had an experience of getting rolfed, and if anyone knows what rolfing is, it's deep tissue massage, deep, deep, to uncongest congested muscles so that your posture will be better. And I had a forward posture until I started getting rolfed, and then, you know, and I look, and I, the only cause of that was the bicycle, you know? Now, there are people who are cyclists who don't have any of the problems that I'm talking about, and God bless you. <laughs> God bless you, that's a wonderful thing. But me, and bicycles, uh-uh, I love them and I hate them, you know? Mm -hmm. So. So the next, oh, is that your well, sketch? You, you see, no, this is actually, that was a prior, that was an existing invention from somewhere around 1860. And uh -huh. what they liked about big wheels, and which is why I picked up on this, actually kind of late I picked up on it. The reason they like big wheels is that for a very little amount of effort, you get a lot of return. That wheel, see the circumference? Yes. That circumference on that wheel, I would imagine, is about 20 feet. Yes. So that guy mm -hmm. pedals once, and that 20 feet happens like that. Uh -huh. You see? So big wheels is not my idea. Big wheels has been around since the 1800s. And, and this reminds me, I think someone else was going to invent my bicycle. It was only a matter of time, but you know what happened? The car. The car was invented, and they started uh -huh. mass producing the car. Uh -huh. And by mass producing the car, all bicycles were just like, ah, pff, that was yesterday, you know? And now, what I've come up with is really what I believe someone would have said. Someone was going to say, hey, wait, let's stand up on the pedals and use our arms. <laughs> <laughs> but there was no need to, you know? People didn't want to expend their energy that way. So, uh, how long did it take you to put all this together? Well, I met a guy, oh, that's another one, that's, you're just using, that's the hand brakes there. Uh -huh. um, I met a gentleman from East Hampton who built custom motorcycle frames. His name is Cy Ross. And when it comes to frames and wheels, he knows how to, how to really do the thing. And um, um, I'd say we worked on that for about 20 months. I'd say we were on it for about 20 months. And what we had to do was, you know, I mean, basically what I did, if you, if you saw, there's no axle between those two wheels. Both no, of those I wheels have a tilt, yeah. Uh -huh. So there's no axle in between, because that's where you're standing. And in order to do that, we had to bring in a lot of different kinds of machinery and different kinds of parts. And, you know, it's just a lot of the details and the minutia that, that people forget about. But that's the reality of it. We basically, you know what we did really? It's kind of like we took a normal bicycle and we split it right in half with a buzz saw. That's what we did. Okay, now, there you go. See, now, this is the modern bicycle from the 1880s. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and here they were. They were just getting used to the fact that, you know, these big wheels could really go fast. But the problem, see how high they are up there? Yes. Uh -huh. When you stopped the wrong way or started the wrong way, you cracked your head. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So that's why they got rid of big wheels. Big wheels was stupid. They could not get rid of the axle in the middle of those, you know, if they put two wheels, they had to have a bench or they had to have a chair if they put two wheels side by side. And they said, this is ridiculous. So you have a, a patent for this. Patent pending. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Pending. And mm -hmm. uh, you've, you've shown it around to people. Well, I, I, hope. You, I hope you did. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I've shown it around. And um, the, the most recent uh, um, um, uh, coup for me is to have, um, um, I have now semi-finalist status for the Sundance Channel's Next Big Idea Contest. And 25 from the country people, inventors, were picked up to be in this competition for 10,000, wish it was 10 million, $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and you get to lease, a, a free lease uh, for a Lexus for one year, a hybrid Lexus. So I'll give that to my wife, because I'm a bad driver. I'm a bad driver. But uh, yeah, so that's really thrilling. <laughs> oh, it is. And I, I think you're going to win that. That's really wow. exciting. Yeah. Well, Very it's great. Easy. I've won already. You know, I've won already. 
Yeah, because second <laughs> one, it's, 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 it's going to get big, big recognition. Yeah, yeah exposure. Yeah. And, um, well, they do have like bicycle races with regular bikes. Do you think this kind of bicycle would be... No, I, it wouldn't be, be fair. It no, would no, be... I, I don't mean against it. Oh, okay. But <laughs> everybody's doing this kind of bicycle mm -hmm. and yeah, uh, you could mind. enter it into races. Mm -hmm. Um, I would uh, actually the first thing I'm going to do when I get the second level prototype what you're looking at there is my yeah. first level prototype and the first level prototype makes the argument that this can be done this guy is not just crazy it was with this uh, first prototype that I got the attention of NASA and NASA said yep the principles make sense let's develop this with you we will develop this with you until it goes to market that's what the promise was from them so where it'll go from there will be something that's lightweight, high tech. Oh my gosh, you really almost drives gone itself. Places. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, I met other people who invented, but they weren't inventors, but they never got recognized. So well, you're the first one that I met. Yeah, so um, that's very exciting. So where are you from? Well, hmm, I'm right now living in East Hampton. This is the longest I've lived any place. Is East Hampton. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe about, um, hmm, maybe about 18, 18, 19 years now. Um, and prior to that, I was living in Huntington, but I was born in Massachusetts. And by the age of three, I was in New York. Uh -huh. riding, riding the subways at around five. <laughs> it was a I different hope, time. <laughs> I hope you didn't do it by yourself. Yeah, by myself, yeah. yeah. At age five. You were riding the bu I mean the subways, subways and the airplanes. Manhattan. Airplanes too, yes. Pretty Are crazy. you talking about commercial airplanes? Mm -hmm. Where did you I go? I always had my own little stewardess. Is your mommy and daddy here yet? No, I want to stay with you. Anyway. <laughs> How come you did so much travel? Well, my parents uh, got divorced when I was three, so they were in different states for a little while. You know, so I like Oh, traveling. so you had to go visit different states. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that must have been very, was it hard on you? Well, I think so. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was young, and I tell you that I did get solace in riding a bicycle, you know, because it was something that I could do, and, you know, making it up hills is a great thing. That's just a, a metaphor for life, you know. I, I had my own consolation with a bicycle that, you know what, it's not easy, nothing's easy. And you, you, you know, you bicycle and you're on a flat for a little while, and it's very comfortable, and then you get a hill every once in a while. You have to go up, and sometimes you get a downhill, and that's really nice. Where did nice. you go to school? Um, I went to school, um, wow, a lot of places. <laughs> <laughs> until, until, actually, I graduated from Huntington High School, and then I graduated from Stony Brook University. Oh. So those are the two most So how recent. did you end up in the hemp? Um, well, I had, a, I had a, um, an experience, I had a major calamities, like five of them. I, I, my car engine blew up, my, my roommate uh, quit on the lease, my girlfriend broke up with me, and I got fired. <laughs> fired from where? Uh, I, was working, I was working with an organization called uh, Shazam, and Shazam would provide um, um, dancers and, and magicians and all different kinds of people for um, for your affairs, and, and we spent a lot of time selling to bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs, and we would get these costume performers to just get people up and dance, and that was the thing, you know. But so I was just, that a profession by your choice, or you just happened to well answer an ad? I answered an ad for a sales <laughs> position, and I ended up oh. having to be like a you know a guy in a tuxedo that would tell the performers when to come out and dance. Well, uh, there's some strange jobs you get. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? I spoke to people who told me that inventors generally do stuff just like that. They will go here and they'll go there and they'll do this and they'll so do that. So what, what did you do after you got fired? What did you? <laughs> well, I, I decided that I needed to make some good money and a friend of mine was an architect out here mm -hmm. who said that uh, there were houses going up all the time and that he could probably hook me up with some you know, builders, and, and he did. And I, I stayed with them for a while, which Doing was good. What? I learned a lot, carpentry. Oh, well, yeah. that's wonderful, yeah, yeah. carpentry. So I like, yeah. I like special projects now. I do well, you are, projects. you certainly have many different sides. <laughs> well, you know, they're joined, I think, there's math. There's math in this, there's math in the bike, because it was a, a sense of it that I had to have. I had to know mm -hmm. about proportions 
with that with that bicycle that, that we were showing a picture of, if you notice, you know, the center of gravity, which is about here. A person's mm -hmm. center of gravity, where they're going to lead, where they go is always going to be led by that center of gravity, right? I have it below the spinning axes of the wheels so that whatever you do in there, because of that proportion already set up, whatever you do in there, you're stable, you know? So there's math in the drumming, there's math in the invention. I don't know if there's math in sales, but... <laughs> Well, it's because of this yeah, there math. Is. <laughs> how much money you're going to make? <laughs> That's exactly. math. Exactly. So, how long are you married? Yeah, oh, look at that. Yeah, What's is. that? See, so see how the axes are, and see where the yellow belt is. The yellow belt is about where your bread bo box would be, yes. where, your, where your center of gravity would be, and then mm -hmm. where you see the center of the wheels, it's above that. Did you ever uh, go on this on the street or well, so? Well, <laughs> see, what I have in there right now. Yeah. Is a is a, a sprocket capable when I when I'm uh, when I'm pedaling as fast as I can that sprocket will allow the wheels to go 15 miles an hour, but that's only one sprocket. And again, that's like if you ever made a dress. If you ever made a dress, you have a paper pattern cut out. Then you have a muslin, and then you make it out of real material. Okay. This is like the paper stage, what we were just looking at. It was kind of like the paper stage. My next question is, sure, can you sure. use this for transportation? I'm, I'm planning on it. It will go car speeds. It will go as fast as On the as highway? Possible. I want to get it on the highway. Let's see what happens. We'll see. But it'll go car speeds and easily. And what, uh, how, much, how fast can you go? Well, I've, like I said, with that one that, that we had the picture of, um, that sprocket would only allow me 15 miles an hour. The next version of this will have a, a hydraulic transmission in the back behind your feet. It'll have multiple gears. It'll have enough gears for you to start uh, you know, on the flat or start on a hill like this. And I believe, I'm, I'm pretty sure it'll do speeds upwards of 50 miles an hour. Because that's a big wheel. It's big wheels. When you 50 miles, it's something in addition to the hydraulic, you're going to have to pedal yourself? You'll pedal, but you'll have the gearing. So the gearing will uh -huh. match you. And I believe everybody, you, me, camera girl, camera boy, camera girl, <laughs> will be able to get in this thing and keep up with traffic. That's what I believe. Oh, so it's not only going to take you places, but you're exercising oh, at the yeah. same time. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's very important. America needs this. Oh, yes, because yeah. everybody's so fat. Oh, and then we complain. <laughs> oh, you know, my big meal isn't big enough. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is getting bigger and bigger. We started the bagel small and now it's <laughs> like this. So uh, how long are you married? Um, oh, my, 17 years. Wow, yeah. you have a family? Well, my wife and I have a cat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we love the cat, and the cat doesn't love me. The cat loves her. <laughs> oh. Well, not everybody has uh, a cat. Mm -hmm. This is true. <laughs> this is true. This is yeah. true. We're, I think we're going to be adopting one soon. We had a calico we just lost uh, a couple of months ago. She was old, 22. Wow. She lived to 22, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. one could get very attached yeah. to animals. Yeah. Yes, I know. Yeah. And where is your wife from? Well, she's actually from Florida to begin with. And um, now she, she lives out here, you know, of course, with me. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and she works with the Artists Alliance, the East End Artists Alliance. Oh, I'm familiar with yeah. that. I have Tom Steele on my show. Yeah, Tom's the best. I love Tom. Yes. Tom and I are both Aquarius. That's Both why what? Aquarius. That's why oh. she and, and Tom get along in the office so well. Oh. <laughs> so, and where did you meet? Um, I met my wife at a bar called The Cafe, which became the Blue Parrot Cafe. Oh. Yes. That's, didn't they just go out of business? Um, I think they just sold. I think Ralph Lauren bought them. I really? Think, yeah, I think so. But that may be, I shouldn't know that. I don't know. Because <laughs> uh, what's his name? Roland, Ronald, Ro Roland. He he was the manager or mm -hmm. the owner. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and Lee and I love Lee. Lee actually introduced us. Lee, Lee, who owned it. Yeah, Lee. Lee was the one that owned it. Oh. And uh, he introduced my wife to me. <laughs> oh well, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what happens in a small community. You just meet everybody. Mm -hmm. I really like living here, and oh. I'm far away from where I was born, but 
I, I love it here because you go, I go every place I go, I always meet somebody and people know me and that makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. But we're very lucky. We're almost like the city in the sense that there's so many people coming through here all the time. Yes. You know? I love what you're the talking melting about. Melting pot. New people. Yeah, just like that. <laughs> melting pot. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So great. Uh, did you ever, do you ever go to Guild Hall? That's my favorite hangout. I <laughs> love Guild Hall. I like what they've been doing with music lately. And um, um, they actually uh, um, had us twice for the Surfrider benefit where they had a movie and they asked us to play um, the Samba School to play for them while they had their movie going on. So that was really very, very nice. So yeah, mm -hmm. I like Guild Hall for its, um, um, you know, uh, for the fact that it's out there trying to expose us to art all the time. Yes, yeah. and they give a chance for everyone to mm -hmm. do something, mm -hmm. which is great. Mm -hmm. So we have <coughs> maybe a minute more. Mm -hmm. Just one minute more. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot where that comes from. <laughs> So I would like to <coughs> thank the crew at LTV, uh, Lee Davis, my director, Evan Zadi, the camera girl, <laughs> and my underwriters. Um, there's, uh, my newest one is Irv Ackerman. He's a dear, dear friend. I know him <coughs> since I'm 16. Would you believe it? <laughs> and Taylor Cohen and uh, the pizza place who's helped me underwrite it. And uh, it was such a pleasure having you here. I learned an awful lot from you, Curtis. Well, thank you very much. And I hope, and I hope you're gonna win that. But as you said, you already won. And this is the way I say goodbye to people. Bye, everybody uh, over there. That one, there he is. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> the bye, bye, bye. Light. <laughs> and uh, you could tune in. <coughs> up the island and in Manhattan uh, because I take the tapes over there. Ah, very good, very good. Yes. So, I meet so I know.